Today's episode is brought to you by public.com, an investing platform which you'll be hearing more about later on in the show. But for now, let's get into today's interview. I'm joined once again by Daniel DiMartino Booth of Quill Intelligence. Danielle, welcome back. How have you been? I've been great, Jack. You know, just really quiet on my Twitter feed, just all calm waters, just lots of fun. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's nothing to talk about. We pretty much have to, you know, make the drama up because there's there's nothing to go. go well, Jack, we've had three weeks in a row of a shrinking Fed balance sheet, so people are running out of things to talk about. Okay, that's a great point. So. <laughs> uh, people, because the Fed's balance sheet was going up because of the new special programs, people were saying this is quantitative easing. You are on the opposite side of the shop. I'm going to put a pin in that. We, I will ask you about that. But sure. for D- Danielle, you know, the big uh, bank earnings have been coming out. They look pretty good so far. So within the banking system, it seems that the, the negative effects are, are somewhat being contained. But what do you think are the broader effects on the economy? I'm talking about availability of credit. I'm talking about uh, uh, banks pulling back on their loans, and I'm I'm just you know talking about uh, uh, the sort of d- decline in in money and loan growth. So I think that that's something that we have to pay really close attention to here, Jack. Um, w- when you hear things like a CarMax come out and say, you know, we're going to be tightening up our lending standards for our own proprietary financing unit, uh, that's a red flag, and when you see Mannheim used car prices start to come down, when you see loan, the flip side of it, and nobody talks about this, demand for loans. The percentage at the beginning of of April, according to Cox Automotive, this is dealer track, they track um, just individuals walking into dealerships and filling out an application to finance a car loan. When you see that that's down 23% year over year at the beginning of April, that's its own red flag. That that that's also households saying, "No way, I'm going to buy a car at these interest rates. I'm not even going to try." Uh, so, and, and and but we we can talk for days about commercial real estate, but it's pretty apparent that that refinancing is going to get very ugly very quickly, or we wouldn't be seeing more instances of of companies walking away. I think what is What's going to be next is really what we're not seeing, whether there are going to be other areas of clampdown in, um, in in terms of credit extended to households, credit extended to businesses. We've not seen a big pickup in commercial and, and, and industrial loans at all. I think banks are, are really paranoid, even the biggest banks that came out with the best earnings. And why wouldn't they, right? Walk down any street, you see these big names, they scream safety, safety in the midst of, you know, smaller banks, Silicon Valley signature going away. So, of course, they've benefited because they are considered to be Main Street America's place to go for a flight to safety. I get that. Uh, but but at the same time, nobody's really talking too much about the, the write downs, the credit write downs at these big banks with dot, 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 a 3.5 percent unemployment rate. So we're just at the beginning of a household credit cycle. We're just now seeing, you know, the Ernst and Youngs of the world come out with, we're going to lay off 3,000 people. And so the white collar recession continues. But by the same token, I think a UBS estimate suggests that there'll be almost 1,000 retail locations that are closed in the United States this year alone. So the layoffs are not going to be uh, sequestered necessarily in the higher paying white collar jobs. They're also going to go down the income ladder as hard as that is to believe or would have been to believe a year ago, because these are the individuals who've been paid the least, had the most in terms of financial incentives to stay out of the workforce, forced back in, and now they're being cut. So again, we're at the precipice of a household credit cycle and banks are already what was it? JP Morgan. They just, I think they just upped their loan loss provisions by 1.1 billion. Not small numbers. And, and just walk us through, not just in the banking system, but there's a sort of ripple effect throughout the shadow banking system and uh, uh, you know, non-bank lenders, private debt. What's going on in that world? Because people can look at the stock market and it's looking really good. But in that private world of private equity, venture capital, private debt, You've been doing a lot of work on this, and we can put some of your your charts up. Just Mm -hmm. tell us what you're seeing there. 
Well, you're seeing um, deathly silence, which is not a good thing. Um, there is there is simply too much money that has been thrown in the direction. I saw I saw a headline a few days ago about a nursing home uh, going bankrupt, and I'm like, a nursing home in the midst of all these baby boomers <laughs> moving into nursing homes. What's going on here? Uh, a lot of private debt that that's been raised in recent years has flowed into smaller types of companies than we would normally associate with KKR, Barbarians at the Gate, the takeover of RJR Nabisco. In the absence of sources of funding for small, mid-sized companies, you've had private debt step in. You've also had private debt, I think, which, I think it's $1.4, $1.5 trillion market that really didn't exist in 2000. You've also had this niche market that is now as big as the junk bond market. And right, we have to, let's contextualize this. This is not leveraged buyout. This is not venture capital. This is private debt. And we, we learned last week that Bloomberg had said, well, we've seen the first time, for the first time in years, we've seen the high yield uh, bond market shrink to 1.4 trillion. First time we've seen shrinking in years. And yet we've got the private debt market that's as big as, as that. And last year in the fourth quarter, when the biggest investment banks could not do syndicated lending, the private debt market stepped in. So not only are they inappropriately on Main Street, but they're making loans that they also, it's also not appropriate that they make. They're not in the middle of the market, which is what was originally conceived. If you weren't a multi-billion dollar takeover, then there was this couch industry that was born that was in between VC, in between leverage buyouts, and now it's grown to be a monster and public pensions own 69% of it. So that's one area that I'm looking at very closely because the media so far, the media maintains that this is going to be a, a safe haven on the private capital side. I say I'm not so sure. And then you've got true venture capital, which became a monster, just a monster in the last few years. We forget that the term unicorn was, was coined a decade ago. And when it was called a unicorn, it was because it was pretty darn rare to run into one of these things in your local forest. And the person who coined the term used the word rare. So it's rare that a venture capital... That, that, that a startup can get a billion dollar valuation. And by the time 2021 rolled around with the Fed keeping interest rates cemented to the zero ground, I mean, you, you, you could, you know, they, had, they needed to put up signs on freeways, you know, watch out for running unicorns crossing the highway. Don't hit one. There were so many of them. Right. And this is the chart we're, we're showing right now, which is the birth rate of unicorns. At, at what point does a, a privately venture capital uh, funded company reach that billion dollar valuation steadily mm -hmm. rose from 2016 to 2019? We saw an absolute explosion, as you can see on the chart in 2021 and, and particularly uh, 2022, 2020. And it's not really happening a lot uh, uh, now. Danielle, you know, connect that back to the Federal Reserve and the fiscal stimulus. And, you know, some people don't like it when we call it money printing, but let's just be real. It's, it's money printing that occurred in, in, in 2020. Oh, gosh. Nobody <laughs> denies that we had full blown, unchecked, unfettered quantitative easing in 2020, 2021, the likes of which, you know, we, we, we haven't seen in forever. And that's what got the Fed's balance sheet originally up to $9 trillion, because it, but, it, but it was $9 trillion of securities held on that balance sheet. It was a third of the mortgage-backed securities market, and money was cheap and abundant everywhere, especially in Silicon Valley. And we had the SPACs, and there was just every celebrity, whether it was from Hollywood or from the NFL, everybody had a sec an, an SPAC named after them and, and money was just thrown. Everybody was a unicorn. And, and it seemed to make sense at the time, didn't it? And then it didn't. And then the Fed started raising interest rates and then to add insult to industry, to, to, to injury, excuse me, I think to mention industry, then you have Silicon Valley go away. 
And all of a sudden, venture capital goes not just from being, well, gee, we can't exit. It's too expensive to exit. And the IPO market's closed. And the CLO market, the, the junk bond market's closed. How the hell are we going to get out of these things? So you have that situation compounded by the types of banks that went under, that catered to the venture capital community. All of a sudden now people are like, I don't wanna know. It could be the most viable venture. It could be the next Google of the world. But people now are just stepping back and they're saying, "Mm -mm, I'm not gonna touch it if it's VC. And Danielle, tell us what you've been seeing, what you've been hearing over the past month after the fall of Silicon Valley Bank, because we will have a chart, we'll, we'll put it up in a, in a bit, just of the venture capital money fund raised in 2022. And people think, oh, in 2022, the Fed raised rates, all these high value tech companies that went public in 2020 and 2021 mm-hmm. collapsed in value. So it must've been a bad year for venture capital. And it was, but in terms of fundraising, actually more money was raised in 2022 than 2021. So are we having kind of a delayed effect here where uh, sort of the roosters is, is, you know, chickens finally come home to roost? We are. Uh, and in fact, um, you know, the, the irony was, uh, t- to me at least, the most ironic headline that I've seen in the last year. I mean, look at look at the deal count that you just put up um, in, in 2021. So the deals were getting, the money was getting raised and the deals were getting done. In 2022, the money was getting raised and the deal flow show slowed appreciably. So far in 2023, crickets. So, but that being said, you know, venture capital firms are sitting on upwards of $500 billion of dry powder. It's a lot of, of money that is sitting there waiting to be pumped into uh, private ventures and startups in a situation where, you know, if you're a general partner, how do you deduce, how do you do, do how do you conduct due diligence? How do you say, given valuations are coming down as quickly as they are, where a, a firm should be funded. So this is a very tenuous situation at best. And yet, to your point, let's draw a parallel to Blackstone raising a $30 billion real estate fund last week. Again, these are the vestiges of public pensions having to deploy or being told they need to deploy uh, money. Uh, and that's what we typically see when we're at the beginning of an unwind cycle. So all those massive deals that were done in 2021, 2020, 2022, you don't know what how big the write downs are going to be. You just know that they're going to be written down. Right. And how much uh, amelioration is done by the fact that you have a lot of dry powder in venture capital and private equity? You said Blackstone just raised this, this large uh, $30 billion fund. If valuations are coming down, the sector needs to refinance and reinjection of, of liquidity. If there is a lot of dry powder, that could make that transition a little a little smoother. No, what do you say to that? The possibility that private equity bails itself out is there. We've seen a few headlines to that effect, um, and, and undeniably, one of the things that has pressed up private valuations in the last few years is that they have this cute little game where they get they take a little startup. And then they tack on a you know few hundred billion dollars of or more, uh, excuse me, few hundred million or billion dollars of valuation, and then they sell it to another private equity company, which sells it to another private equity company at an even higher valuation. So we could see that game continue. The question though becomes one of what kind of scrutiny will politicians potentially, regulators potentially be put under in years to come to police this area of, of the market that is, that's larger, right? $240 trillion outstanding compared to $180 trillion in the global conventional financial system. But what happens if, if the worst case scenario comes to pass? If the Fed's Christopher Waller who is Powell's chief lieutenant and alluded to the fact that there could be a June rate hike. Uh, What if he's right? What if, you know, what, what if rates are, are maintained, simply maintained at a high level for the remainder or for most of the rest of 2023? At some point, CalPERS is going to have to come out and say, we've marked our private holdings to market. 
And then Jack, as my lovely mentor, Harvey Rosenblum, always used to say, and then the peanut butter is going to hit the fan. <laughs> so it, I get that private equity can buy itself some time because it's got all of this dry powder. Uh, but by the same token, I worry about how much latitude that they're going to have to continue being the ones who make the rules in an environment in which interest rates are maintained at a high level and quantitative tightening continues, which again, that shuts down. Last week, we had a rally in the stock market. It was insane. And immediately, you know, hit $495 million uh, CLO priced in the market. Junk bonds were being sold. Investment bankers are sitting there ready. That pipeline of deals to get sold to into any rally, it's ready to go. But last time everything kind of shut down for a long time, it was like a 25 day drought. And again, at some point there will be a mark to market moment, at least on the public pension side. And it ain't going to be pretty. Yeah. That mark to market point is, is so important. Just sticking in the world of venture capital, hypothetically, if you and I both had a smoothie company, two different companies, your company kept private, your unicorn, a billion dollars. Congratulations, by the way. My company also valued a billion dollars, but I went public, uh, uh, um, you know, it'd be an IPO or a SPAC in, in 2020. My valuation would have collapsed over the end of 2022, whereas yep. you're still sitting pretty because your valuation is, you know, you can't you can't look it up on a on, on a finance. It doesn't it doesn't trade. It's it's illiquid. Likewise, right. that that you know, I mean, there were people who invested in publicly traded uh, uh, technology stocks, you know, unprofitable technology stocks. Who said, "Look at the world of VC," and I pointed to that uh, uh, dichotomy. Likewise, in the world of, let's say, commercial real estate, the real estate investment trust (SLG), uh, VNO, Vernado, those have collapsed in value, probably you know, close to eighty percent of the yep. stocks. However, the marks on private equity and on the loans against those real estates. Those are you know being valued you pretty close to par. Tell us about that world. At what point do you think we're going to have a sort of aha moment where the the, the valuations uh, converge between the public markets and the private markets? So, Jack, if, if there really aren't many more bank failures, then we go back to happy status quo, which is regulators looking the other way. If, as Brookfield Management alluded to, we instead uh, go to a situation in which it looks like the it looks like lenders are like, no, we got to refinance this stuff, and Brookfield's like, okay, if you insist, here's the keys. There's ten offices in Washington D.C. where Green Street says office prices are have fallen thirty six percent year over year. I'm not refinancing that with you, not at these interest rates. So that I think is where we are today. If, if, if the heat is maintained on regulators, I think that that's another big um, factor that plays in right now because they'll be asked to get these commercial real estate loans the hell off your balance sheet that you extended and pretended through the pandemic and get rid of these 140% LTV car loans sell the cars at auction. But I think those are the two areas that, that to me run as corollaries to the day that, that bank regulators were forced to tell the banks to write their subprime holdings down a generation ago. So if there aren't any more bank failures, maybe the regulators continue to play nice. But if, if the companies that are being forced to renegotiate or forced to refinance, if that envelope continues to get pressed, then I think it's I think it's perfectly logical to continue to see a more rapidly unfolding commercial real estate cycle than we ever have in modern history. Most people think this is going to be drawn out over several years. We'll see. And yeah, I feel like three or four times a week, I see either you or Dan McNamara on Twitter post about Jingle Mail, a, a large developer just He's sent the keys rockstar, back to the, right? the bank. He's a rock star. Yeah, yeah, because uh, it's non-recourse debt. So they, mm -hmm. they can seize the building, but they can't seize anything else. So they just say, hey, here, here are the keys. In in those stories that you, know, you, you or Dan uh, typically post, 
who are the lenders? Are they the private debt funds or are they mostly the banks? And what sort of disclosures are you seeing there? Uh, you know, are because uh, are are they are they taking their losses? Are they sort of taking their their, their the beatings or or no? Well, in most cases, these loans are going to go into special servicing, and and that actually buys a lot of time uh, for there to be a workout. So um, it, it's it's extremely complicated. Uh, it's an extremely complicated industry, depending on who the lender is. The vast the the, the biggest area of if the Brookfield I told you about went went into special servicing uh, last night. Uh, but the biggest area of that has to be rolled over this year is into CMBS. And you typically do get a few years once the property flips from the holder to the special servicer. They typically have a way to try and work through that. And obviously the hope is that they're not that they're given enough time for interest rates to fall. But you still do not want to see spiking special servicing rates because again this is another sign for you know to go knock 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 on the some somebody there was a bank in Massachusetts that reported a, a few days ago client sent it to me client sent me their balance sheet and he said oh, the bulk of their commercial real estate loans are high rise office properties in San Francisco I said what this is a small community bank in Massachusetts what are you talking about that's why I think we could see Fire sales sprinkled with, we'll work it out in special servicing. If you've been listening to Forward Guidance, you probably know that treasure yields have been surging. Right now, you can get a 5.1% yield on your cash with treasury bills. That's pretty good. It's even better than what you can get with a traditional high yield savings account. So owning U.S. treasuries is great, but buying them is super complicated, or at least it was. You used to have to go to a bank or navigate a government website that looked like it was designed in the 90s. Thankfully, investing platform public.com has changed all that with the launch of treasury accounts. Now you can move your cash into U.S. treasuries right from your phone. And you can do it with the flexibility of a bank account. There are no minimum hold periods or settlement delays. In other words, you can access your cash whenever you want. And the best part is that because it's government-backed treasury bills, it's an incredibly safe place to park your cash. Public.com will even automatically reinvest your treasury bills at maturity so you don't have to do anything to continue growing your yield. So to get that 5.1% yield on your cash, go to public.com slash forward guidance to move your cash into a treasury account today. Thanks. Let's get back to the episode. Yes. And fire sales are not good on illiquid assets because, you know, if you have to sell it, you you can take take quite a hit. Uh, Danielle, this uh, commercial real estate exposure is quite uh, targeted to the smaller banks. So we've got a chart. We'll put it up uh, uh, now. Uh, mm-hmm. On the left, we've got the large banks exposure to commercial real estate in blue and the small banks exposure in red. And as you know, folks can see, uh, small banks make up a disproportionate amount of loans to commercial real estate. They also make up a disproportionate amount of uh, deposit flight. People are, you know, tend to be withdrawing money from these regional banks and putting it in JP Morgan, Bank of America, the, the big globally systemically important banks. How do you see this playing out? So, you know, I I speak to people who are in this world all the time, and this is kind of where I become Danielle on her soapbox. I I think we need to find a way to to potentially have the FDIC absorb some of these loans um, as they did for Signature, as they did for Silicon Valley. Right now, BlackRock is in the process of selling um, a, a lot of these, but and, and, but those are mortgage-backed securities, to be clear. But I, I think that we should have a mechanism to not just set a brush fire across rural America and let them all burn down. Because judging by Treasury Secretary Yellen's attitude in front of Congress a few weeks ago, that was, it seemed like, the game plan. Just let them go. The United States is overbanked. I, I hope that politicians throughout the country look at the chart that we're looking at right now and see that the reason that smaller banks took a nosedive into uh, inappropriately high shares of commercial real estate on their balance uh, on their balance sheets is because Dodd-Frank required them to banks with 10 billion dollars of assets in order to require them to do overly onerous 
stress tests. We, we, we can let Silicon Valley bank off the hook, but you little guy, you, you still have to comply with the stress test until 2019 when they eased that off. But in that interim, you know, for almost a decade or so, you had small banks trying to do whatever they could to offset the overhead cost of complying with the Fed's stress tests. Somebody finally woke up and said, gee, this, is, this just seems like a bit much for a small bank. And they let that pressure off, but the damage had, be, had already been done. <clears throat> so, you know, it's, it's not a matter of moral hazard or is the Federal Reserve going to open up? Because we're not talking about Harry and Meghan's lifetime savings here sitting at Silicon Valley Bank. This ain't them. So, uh, so to, to, to have this kind of let them burn attitude when you're talking about the lender of last resort for many small towns, because Jamie Dime is not open in a branch there at all. So to, to talk about it with such, with, with such bravado, we can just let them go. The country's overbanked. I, I think that that's, I, I hope that there are bank regulators right now watching this and listening to me because there are many people who have thought through this and have solutions where the FDIC can come in and make sure that there is not, as I said, a brush fire across rural America. Thanks. Danielle, let's move on to the auto loan market. Yeah. If car, car values keep rising, yeah. auto loans kind of by de definition are going to be good because you can you know, the collateral is, is, is more valuable. But if they fall, you, you get the opposite effect. There was a time we spoke in uh, late October, early November of last year, where you were quite worried about the, the auto market. And I know auto prices have kind of gyrated all over the place. It's hard for me to, to follow it unless you, you know, follow it regularly. What are you seeing there? I know you said CarMax reported recently, and I believe Ally Financial reports tomorrow. What are you, what are you seeing there? The, the craziest thing about car prices, to your point, is that we've seen new car prices decline for three months in a row, but they're just now under MSRP. And What's that? That, uh, that list, list price. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Manufacturers suggest at retail price. Mm -hmm. So just, to, it took three declines in prices to even get buyers to be at retail. So they've been paying above MSRP for the 19 months that preceded this. This goes to the discussion that we were having about these crazy loan to values, loans that are sitting on bank balance sheets right now. The Wall Street Journal had a story out last week. People are doing, I don't know, whatever you call jingle mail for your car. Mm -hmm. People are walking away from their cars, used cars, because they, they bought it out of desperation uh, they paid way too much for it. Their payment was too high and like the transmission fell out. Something major. And it is a two, three thousand dollar repair. I had to let so I just so I, I gave the car back. We're gonna see a lot more of that. Mannheim came out just this morning and said that there was this blip in the first quarter, used car prices popped back up. They're starting to come back down because income tax refund season was a disaster. So Christmas in car land was canceled. So now you've got uh, used car inventories exactly where they were in 2019 with falling demand and car prices falling for new and used. And a lot of loans that are sitting out there where the balance of the loan is worth way more than the car. So, and again, this is going to become a very societal thing because <clears throat> you can Google repo man shooting. Yeah. See, but you can Google it. Wow. And people get really upset when you take away the means by which they're going to get back and forth to work. I had somebody today blow my hair out. Did she do a good job? Definitely. I, I, I suggested to her that there was a freelance opportunity for her, but that it was 20 minutes North. And I could throw her hair. I could throw her name in because she did such good hair. And she's like, I really can't right now. I'm, I'm Ubering. I said, why are you Ubering? She said, well, I live, I live really close to here, but my car's broken down and my car payment's too high. Hmm. So I'm Ubering back and forth to work. So I can't take any gigs that are far away because I can't afford the Uber. It'll offset what I make on the gig. And I'm like, okay, well, let me know. Wow. But she's not alone. She's not alone. She's not going to be alone. We made 
if you look at the statistics, you see people between the ages of 19 and 29, and then people between 29 and 39 took out ungodly amounts of car debt since the pandemic hit. You know, these are these are real case, real human beings, and it's going to get ugly if they lose their cars. Exactly. And if you take out a loan when car values are very elevated at 70% loan to value, but then the price of your car goes gets cut in half, suddenly it's 140% loan to value. So loans that don't seem irresponsible can can become so if if the collateral uh, values fall really sharply. Okay, so so that's auto. Should we talk about housing? <laughs> yeah, let, let's, let's let's talk about housing. Daniel, what are you seeing there? I don't follow housing, you know, nearly as closely as you do, uh, but I know there's been a, a slight pickup in some prices. But uh, something tells me that you're you're a, a doubter of this housing rebound narrative. What are you seeing? We have seen um, a, a nice uptick in activity with with the down tick that we've seen in mortgage rates, but we've certainly, I mean, you've still got mortgage rates that are north of 6%. So for, let's just say your average American's got a mortgage of 3%. So it's at least double. So fresh data out from mortgagers is, you know, refinancing volumes remain in the doldrums. They've slashed so many positions. Headcount has come down so much at, uh, at mortgage lenders that they're able to start finally finding, you know, being able to operate profitably again, because there've been enough purchase applications to buy loans. But what we're not seeing yet, and, you know, I, I talk to my buddy Ivy Zellman all the time, and she always says to me, Danielle, it doesn't matter where mortgage rates are, the unemployment rate trumps mortgage rates every day. And we're just now seeing the layoff cycle really accelerate to where it's showing up in the actual data in the weekly jobless claims numbers. So um, and in, in an absolute collapse in indeed.com postings, the last time I checked it, uh, they have 47 separate categories of job postings in the United States and 45% were down year over year um, of, of those 47. And in the aggregate, again, this is about a month old data, but in the aggregate, uh, job postings are down 10% year over year. So the demand for labor is simply not there. Uh, you know, once we empty out this construction pipeline and get all of these homes built that builders didn't have labor for, but now they've got labor. Once that's all finished, you'll probably see a million jobs come out of the construction sector. Uh, so we're at the beginning of the second, you know, housing 2.0, housing bubble 2.0 bursting. We're just at the beginning of that. And Airbnb got so out of hand, so out of control, not putting a governor, not putting a cap on how many homes could be purchased uh, to be rented out short-term rental, that right now it's simply a matter of, even though there's still some demand in that market, it's come off. But the supply situation is just out of control. And so you read funny stories. 30% of this city's uh, rentals are sit vacant. That doesn't last for indefinitely, especially if it's not one of these Airbnb, VRBO jocks who've got or who are sitting on multiple mortgages. So there is a lot of pent up supply in the US housing market. It's not sitting in the hands of my next door neighbor with a 3% mortgage who you could drop a bomb in his front yard and he's not moving. He's got that 3% mortgage. And by the way, and his kid living in the basement. So you've multiple generations, that situation is, in, is increasing. But you will not have people who are servicing mortgages, but not able to cash flow, positive them, be able to hold those homes indefinitely. So there is pent up supply in the US housing market. And you've got tons of multifamily and tons of single family supply coming online just this year and in 2024 as, as well on the multifamily side. And that's why you're seeing, you saw Redfin announced that we're seeing year over year declines in rents for the first time in years. Mm. But th that is not, the, the Redfin data is not what is directly reported into the consumer price index, right? Nope. It, it may come in later, but it's it's a little leading, right? So we did see a dip in um, in the shelter component of the CPI, 
And that was kind of what got people all excited. The Fed's finished. They're going to pause. The interest rate sensitive sector sectors are getting hit. This is exactly what they wanted to see. No, they actually mentioned a rising unemployment rate if you really listen hard. But but this is what they want to see. So they're going to pause. So I, I talked to my buddy, Omer Sharif, and he is kind of Mr. In the Weeds inside of the CPI data. And he noted that a lot of the largest cities have seen just collapsing rents. And that flowed through to the surprising downside in the shelter component of the latest CPI report that we had. But just last week, we heard that rents in Manhattan had ticked up to a record high. And that's 11% of the shelter CPI. And that will filter through in coming months, as well as the lagged effect of Mannheim increases that were not manifest in the CPI. So those two areas are going to keep the CPI elevated. I'm not saying we're going to turn around tomorrow and see year over year CPI increase, even though we will at the headline because gas prices have come up, mm -hmm. prices at the pump. But what I'm saying is the core could be extremely sticky because we haven't seen the first quarter of increases in Mannheim, even though they've turned around, they filter through the CPI with a two, three month lag. We haven't seen that yet. And we haven't seen the effect of New York City rents being at a record high filter through to the shelter component. So I expect to see some steadiness in those inputs, which will not be friendly because it won't be pulling the core down and it will be giving Fed officials the latitude that they need to say, you know, maybe June's a good idea. We'll see. Happy summer. <laughs> yeah. So the the somewhat uh, you know, grim economic outlook that, that you've been sharing us th throughout this interview, it sounds like a, if not a deflationary cocktail, then a disinflationary cocktail that you know, when the economy goes into a recession, typically inflation, inflation falls, sometimes it, it falls sharply. Help me square that with the uh, uh, somewhat sticky core inflation uh, outlook that that you just said. Is it sort of, you think it will be sticky for a few months and then it will really uh, go down? Well, the problem is come July, we hit base effects. Mm -hmm. That last time we were having the base effect discussion, we were talking about base effects pushing up the CPI, uh, um, excuse me, pulling down the CPI to too great of an extent. Now we're talking about the CPI print it at such a high level that it's going to be hard for it to go up year over year. Once you start comparing it to those absolute all time highs back to 1981, mm -hmm. so you're building on a higher base starting this summer. So, you know, you could end up seeing, I won't, I don't want to say artificially high prints, but, but you're still going to be coming off such a high base that you could see, maintained uh, pressure in CPI, even if disinflation is is working harder. Mm. That, make, that makes sense. Um, so in the minutes of the Fed's March meeting, which which occurred uh, you know a week or two after Silicon Valley Bank uh, failed, uh, they said that they, the staff, I think, not the members, said that they were, you know, were expecting a recession that was mild. What do you make of that uh, outlook? And yeah, I mean, just, just the thought that they actually shared that because, you know, people talk about the Fed all the time, but it's rare that they sort of let something slip. And once once they release that into the public forum, you know, they're kind of sending a message. Yeah, I mean, I was only there for nine years, but it was it was kind of a no, no to mention the R word in public mm -hmm. or even put it in a minute um, or a statement or 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 the chair being at the podium. I think that this is code for telling markets that until the unemployment rate is rising, and we've seen the unemployment rate be extremely sticky because the Bureau of Labor Statistics, what they're adding with the birth death model, hat tip to Mike Green, because a babysitter is, is being qualified as an entrepreneur who started a business just because she's got to report her Venmo. So what we're seeing at this inflection point coming out of BLS is just garbage data. Doesn't matter. The Fed's going to lean on it. And I think the reason they are saying the words mild recession is because they're going to fall back on that to maintain quantitative tightening. The day they meet, it looks like we're probably going to hear about a 50 to $60 billion runoff in treasuries off of the, the Fed's uh, balance sheet. 
I think that the reason they're saying mild recession is for them to be able to say, well, the unemployment rate's not that high come the June meeting. So we're going to raise rates one more time because inflation appears to be kind of sticky over here. Whatever it takes to give them license to keep quantitative tightening running in the background, keeping Janet Yellen up at night. At the next Fed meeting uh, you know, in early May, if you were a reporter, what question would you ask? I would say that the uh, that the New York Fed's uh, SOMA report, um, Fed Fed balance sheet report uh, in early April, stated that they anticipate the at the time it was eight point seven. Now it's eight point five trillion dollar uh, balance sheet. That it would be six trillion dollars in twenty twenty five. That's according to New York Fed uh, projections. So, uh, Chair Powell, is that your anticipation as well? That quantitative tightening run throughout twenty twenty four. And pause when you get to six trillion. Explain to the audience why that's such a, a poignant question, and why you know if you were in Jay Powell's shoes, answering that would be pretty tough. He would melt. <laughs> the, the, the press pool is gagged. They're not allowed to ask him that question. It doesn't matter that the Fed, New York Fed's report is a matter of public knowledge. Uh, but the how critical that is has to deal with the fact that. We are looking at at M2 growth that is only rivaled in the period of 1929 through 1933. In 1929, M2 growth for the year was 0.0%. And then going into 1930, it went negative, which it did in, in last November here in the United States. It did go negative November of last year, year over year for the first time since uh, since 1930. And then it proceeded to go down double digits, negative, into the teeth of the Great Depression. If, if the Fed believes that it can continue to shrink its balance sheet and press M2 down to that level, then Jack, we ain't seen nothing yet. And that's the point that people need to appreciate. In those years, by the way, beginning in 1930, 31, 32, you had negative year over year prints on headline CPI. A few of those years were big deflationary prints. Not, we're not talking about inflation is cooling, disinflation, you know, it has, prices are, are rising, but at a slower pace. It wasn't any of that friendliness. It wasn't. It was it was flat out deflation where as a factor of time, individuals, corporations, debts grow. No. And you had a huge bank run spiral where uh, Bank A failed, causing Bank B to fail. And there was no FDIC insur uh, insurance. I think that was you know in the later 1930s because it was such a, a disaster. Uh you know, I, I, it's not my big base case where we're headed for anything like that. And, uh, no, I, you know, yeah, I just, I just think we should be cognizant of the, the only historic parallel that exists. Yes. And, and how much of that is reflected in, so, you know, I, I haven't looked at the chart recently, but, uh, you know, M2 is basically pu public, uh, money that people can ask uh, bank deposits and, and other such assets. Whereas what the federal reserve controls is, uh, uh, the monetary base, just uh, you know, how many reserves are in the system, which are the assets of commercial banks, the liabilities of the Fed, in the same way that bank deposits are the assets of you know uh, people and companies and the liability of, of commercial banks. I did so they are related. On this, didn't I? Did the whole balance sheet thing? It was a good feather. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You did, you did. Uh, so, they, so they are related. So M two explodes higher when you do quantitative easing, even though the, the Fed does not control M M two. You know. The, the banks are going to buy back the bonds. And we know the banks bought back the bonds because that's why they have all these unrealized losses in 2020 um, F, from, from, from individuals and, and companies. And then that's, uh, so, so deposits are going down. Uh, tell us, how do, you how do you think this is playing out? And particularly the debt ceiling. A lot of people's you know, big risk, Danielle, is that uh, the you know, government is not going to pass a, 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 um, raise the debt ceiling and the, the full, uh, full, full faith and credit of the United States Treasury is, is under question. That obviously would, would be horrible. But there also is a risk if the government does what they're supposed to do, that Treasury Secretary uh, Janet Yellen has a huge refinancing uh, uh, wave that sucks tons of reserves out of the system. Walk us through how you're thinking about this. So um, until 
the weekend, the most recent weekend, I was just thinking about this in the terms that you just described. Um, but, but McCarthy, House Speaker, has come out with this alternative plan B where he might be able to get the, uh, the far right members of his caucus in line if they can just agree to suspend the debt limit until late next May of 2024. So you got the clock ticking in the background really loud because your team mine is less than five months, five months away from election day in the United States. And now you restart debt ceiling discussions into the teeth of a reflection. This might be the only hope that McCarthy has of keeping the gavel because if the four holdouts who insisted on 15 votes to give him the gavel in the first place. If they refuse to move, and the Biden administration appears to be refusing to even have a discussion with McCarthy, so if they refuse to move, then we just go down to the wire. And maybe we, maybe we close a lot of things, the parks, the museums, we, you know, the Department of Education is shut down. The Department of Energy, whatever's whatever's not not in our national security interest, because we only need fifty five billion dollars a month or so, probably sixty billion now now that rates are higher, to service our debt. So it's not a lot of money that we need. But let's just say this presses into the fall, okay, and then it's resolved. Well, then Janet Yellen has to sell enough to compensate all the Smithsonian workers and everybody who was furloughed. She's got to pay everybody back. So however much she put on pause has got to be sold in addition to refilling the Treasury General account, the nation's checking account. So we'll call it six, seven hundred, eight, nine hundred billion dollars of, of Treasury bills. That that's that's plan A. And plan A is actually that's actually better than plan B. For Yellen, it's better than plan B. Uh, but how that works out, most people on Wall Street are like, we'll just do a baton toss. All that money that that's sitting in the Fed's reverse repo facility is just going to flood into the T-bill market as they're sold. So there won't be really any net effect. It'll just be movement of money. We forget that each counterparty at the reverse repo facility is capped at $160 billion on an individual money market fund basis. Then you start saying, well, how much money will move? How much money is going to stay sticky at the Fed? What if the Fed's doing quantitative tightening and maintaining really high interest rates? Because that's why reverse repo facilities have been there in the first place. What if, what if there's the potential for, for just a few more basis points if I just stick with the Fed? Then you hear this giant sucking sound come out of the banking system, which is what you don't want to hear. Let's go to plan B. Let's say that, that McCarthy corrals his caucus, all four of the extremists come back in line and they say, fine, I'll take the ultimate gamble. You could see a red wave or a blue wave, depending on what the economy does in between, but let's say we suspend the debt ceiling for 12 months, okay, fine. Plan B goes through. We don't have to worry about it. With another hat tip to Mike Green, what does Yellen have to do now? Well, now she needs to make sure that she does her math, and adds up everything that the government needs to run through election day. Ah, government spends about 300 billion or so a month. You know, multiply that times 12 plus add on the time to get you to election day. A lot of bills. That is a, a lot of bills. And, and in March, 2020, the Treasury issued a ton of paper, and that was followed by an you know an economic boom from a, a very low base. But the thing was, the Federal Reserve was doing a ton of quantitative easing. Then. Easy. So it, it could you know, reserves in the, the system actually went up. Uh, whereas now, if they're still going to do quantitative tightening, uh, they will go down. Especially if they're not, the money doesn't come out of the Fed's reverse repo facility, which is you know, kind of like a somewhat of a bl of a black hole although money can leave it and you know th that's the, the vision of the hopeful people that oh the, the money's just gonna you know we, it was parked there the excess money is going to come out but as you know our mutual friend joseph wang likes to say it's like different pipes it, it's it's like you know you drink water and it goes down the air pipe you know it's it's it, it's not just uh, a sort of a one-way street it's not and, and, and again you have to bear in mind that we don't that not every 
participant in the reverse repo facility is alike. Some are much bigger than others. Uh, and, and some might take $100 billion at a time and, and buy treasury bills, but some might not. So there's nuance there. There's nothing that is ever a sure thing, a, a true sure thing about the plumbing of the financial system and the ceiling and floor facilities that the Fed is that, that the Fed has set up in the midst of quantitative tightening as Yellen might or might not have to go to market. But the idea that if there's a suspension, she would be pressured to keep enough money to not shut the government down right in front of an election, there, there's, there's some logic there. But again, but again, the more she has to sell, the more pressure there's going to be, maybe the longer and deeper the recession is. It, it's so hard. To, Jack, we can't draw parallels to 2011. We can't. <clears throat> Market came ripping back yep. after that la last debt ceiling standoff. We can't, as you just say, draw parallels to when Mnuchin sold 1.1 trillion. We can't because the Fed was doing QE at the time. There's no parallel historically that can be drawn. What we can draw parallels to is the last time M2 was contracting at the rate it is, which was in 1934. Danielle, that brings us to something that I actually learned from you, the Bernanke doctrine, Ben Bernanke, a uh, Fed chair during the great financial crisis. Mm -hmm. you know, quantitative easing existed before him, but he really brought it to the United States. And so he was something you told me about called the Bernanke doctrine that mm -hmm. quantitative easing, i.e. the holding of large amounts of uh, uh, government securities, particularly long-term government securities, on the, the Fed's balance sheet, a central bank balance sheet, as a policy, not just an interim thing, but a, a, not a stopgap measure, but a, an actual policy as a, as a plan. The Bernanke doctrine is that is an emergency measure that should only be done when interest rates are at zero. So if quantitative easing is needed to uh, you know, help the treasury issue all this, all this paper, uh, that would be against the Bernanke doctrine, right? Because interest rates are not at zero and Powell does not want to go to zero. Uh, that's exactly right. And uh, the, the idea, uh, the Bernanke doctrine requ requires, requires that large scale asset purchases uh, can only be conducted when you are at the zero bound, flies in the face of selling treasuries when the nation's interest expenses are exploding. Um, and there is, there's something to be said for the fact that if this occurs and the Fed is still conducting quantitative tightening, then it's not appropriate for the Fed to buy anything. In fact, it's the opposite of what the Fed would be doing. So you would put the entire onus on other buyers of treasuries. I mean, well, let's see if we can find a silver lining there. I guess the Fed would be spending less money on interest paid on excess reserves. Uh, but no, it's the, the number of conundrums here are innumerable and that's why they're, 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 they're numerous. And that's why most people, if you press them, say the only solution is to go back to zero. The only solution is to go back to larger, large scale asset purchases, because when you ask a question to me, like you just asked, and there's dot, 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 no answer. <laughs> Excuse me. That's pretty problematic. It really is. And, you know, John Williams, former head of the, of the San Francisco Fed, head of the New York Fed now, who's in charge of that markets desk. He was on board for the Bernanke Doctrine. Um, he cer certainly was in that dovish camp before, but it would be, it would be his open market operations desk that would be conducting uh, quantitative tightening while the treasury was flooding the system with, with fresh set, uh, sales of, of treasuries. I, again, I think anybody who thinks that there'll be an elegant outcome is just deluding themselves because this is nothing unlike anything we've ever seen. And to listen to Powell or to not hear the press pool ask about quantitative tightening, which tells you that the press pool has been gagged. Sorry, it's how it works, folks. If you're not allowed to press him on quantitative tightening, that means that he has every intention that it's just gonna keep going. 
Mm. And he has said, I will not help Janet Yellen resolve the debt ceiling. And there are some people who doubt Jay Powell when he, when he says that. You don't. You take him at his word. He wants to kill the Fed put. He does, and he he does not really care that much about uh, 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 the, the the fiscal situation of the of the Treasury. And it's not officially his job to care. In fact, it, it is his job to not care. It, it is his job to not care. Um, I, I am not. I'm not flippant. I have always. Uh, I have always advocated for the little guy and the little gal. And I get that a nasty recession is going to be painful. But we haven't yet had a recession that's painful enough that there's pain inflicted on what we got this discussion started with. And that's 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 private equity. They've never been forced to mark to market. They they've never been forced to concede to what the valuations are. All we know is that Tiger, Tiger Global Management. They, they they wrote down the value of their venture holdings by a third. You know, other, other than that, we don't have many signposts to tell us what that papers, what, what it would trade for in the real world. And yeah. but it's, it's this cohort that has always walked away and said, I won. Right. And if the Federal Reserve wants to help uh, you know, regular people, it's a little perverse. The only way it can do that is by helping rich, really rich people. If you want a stopgap measure for the lower income workers, then you keep making the rich richer. Yes. But if you want to ultimately help working men and women in America, you close the inequality divide. You level the playing field. You regulate private capital. Uh, they don't have different tax laws that apply only to them. Um, hopefully you get a few sane politicians in there to de-oligopolize and de-financialize the U.S. economy so that it's actually running like a, well, I don't know, something that resembles capitalism uh, in, in, a, in, a, you know, in a place where there's risk and reward, but that the risk is still in that equation. Right now, the risk is not part of that equation. It's just reward. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, you write uh, very well about that in Fed Up, which I feel you know, people should check out your, your book. Also, you read it, the audio book, which, which, I, which I really like. Um, Daniel, but second to last question for you is about a certain part of the tax code. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about uh, um, the, the sort of tax credits um, that has been, you know, over $300 billion um, has gone to, to businesses because of this, this, this uh, uh, loophole. Explain, you know, wh why it was passed, but, you know, because I, I didn't know this, if not for, for reading it from you. And I wish, and I wish that um, maybe in editing, you can put the, maybe you can put the big green chart up there. Yeah, definitely. Uh, because this is one of the things that I talk about with the greatest frequency. So when, when the CARES Act was passed, of course, um, at that time, in, in, at that point in time, we saw a lot of small businesses go away, right? Your Walmarts can stay open, your Home Depots can stay open, but mom and pop shops, they got to close. Because we, we couldn't mask up for mom and pop, we could only mask up for Walmart. But the CARES Act was designed really to, to the benefit of the biggest companies, to the detriment of the smallest companies, it had a provision in it that said, if your company was disrupted at any point in tax year 2020, in calendar year 2020, then you can apply to claw back up to $26,000 per employee of payroll taxes. So the first quarter, if you will, after the April passing of the CARES Act in 2020, the first quarter that, that you could apply for this clawback was July of 2020. So there's your timestamp. In the 33 months that preceded July 2020, Uncle Sam made out checks for business income tax refunds of $190 billion. So time stamp that 33 months that preceded when you could apply for this employee tax credit, clawing back up to $26,000 in, in, in payroll taxes per employee. Since July 2020, $380 billion through March the 31st has been sent out. This is the biggest giveaway known to God and man. It was extended when Biden passed that stimulus check that gave Americans $1,400. He also signed in a loophole that said, if you can, if, if you can demonstrate that you had your, your company's operations were disrupted at any time in the first three quarters of 2021, you can go get another Go, go, go twice. You may as well just dip in there twice, right? So go get another tax refund. 
So since then, again, since July of 2020, $380 billion. The real pile up in the graph begins somewhere around the middle of last year when GetRefunds.com, Innovation Taxes, when all of these companies started to come alive to help you get what's yours. And what these companies are, are doing is they're soliciting. They're outwardly soliciting companies to apply for this. Then they're acting like an ambulance chasing contingency lawyer and keeping 30 or 40 percent or 20 percent, whatever it is they're keeping. They're keeping for themselves. Why did I start this answer talking about small businesses? Eh, if you call them because you're because they're advertising on TV now in December, I guess, for the month that peaked out at twenty five point four billion. That was the biggest month on record. And then. February was, uh, January was like 19.1, uh, February was 14.6, then in March it ticked back up to 15.9. We're talking about billions of dollars sent out to wealthy Americans. Why wealthy? Well, if you call one of these places that's doing this service for you, but you've only got a few employees, their take isn't big enough. And by the way, it's not their take. Every single penny of refunds, if you truly qualify, if you were a, a restaurant owner in Los Angeles in 2021 and they truly closed you down and you kept your employees on the payroll, chances are these people aren't going to help you. They can't collect a big enough fee. And this has gone on in the background. It fully explains why the sell side, which I don't think the sell side knows this exists. All the sell side knows is that at some point when that last stimulus check went to went to working American families when that last child tax credit in de December the 15th, 2021, hit Americans' bank accounts that they just know that good spending was handed off to services spending. What they didn't know was that a, a firm that sold itself to private equity, 75% of itself to private equity in, in late 2022, was in the process of monetizing this. Also, uh, applying for uh, a business income tax refund that would be seven figures. And it would be written out over a six month period by the US Treasury. Seven figure income tax refund to a family that's just sold 75% of itself to private equity. Is this what we should be spending taxpayer dollars on right now? We can have that debate another day. The fact is, it's still a ton of stimulus that's being injected into the U.S. economy that explains why there's so much services spending. And we're just now seeing the trend start to come off at the same exact time, dot, 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 as hotel spending is starting to decline. People are spending less on airfares. There's a little bit, because if you don't have all those zillions of dollars flowing into your bank account, you're not necessarily flying the entire family first class to Paris and back. But that explains why the goods to services spending narrative held so tight and why the U.S. consumer has been so strong this whole time. That is ending, sadly, for many families that depended on it. Additional food stamp spending is ending as well, even though they did have a 25% increase in October of 2021, another 20% increase in October of 2022, just based purely on inflation. But still, there was a supplement that was out there. For people receiving food stamps, that's going away. Medicaid extra emergency coverage is going away. And by the way, the Supreme Court should rule any day on student loans and wait for that puppy to kick back in, which I think is somewhere around $300 on average in terms of a payment. Wow. Th thanks for laying that out. Uh, uh, Danielle, final question for you is, I know one you have a lot of thoughts on. The Fed's balance sheet has been declining uh, because of quantitative tightening. It had a kick up uh, you know, shortly after the fall of Silicon Valley Bank because of its discount window lending primary credit, as well as uh, the bank term funding program, BTFP, leading some to say, hey, quantitative easing is back. And just like clockwork, price of Bitcoin exploded higher. Stocks have been on, on, a, on a very big tear. So it it's, has the sort of feeling of March 2020 in terms of quantitative easing is back. I know you do not buy this narrative one bit, and uh, I'd love for you to tell us why. So um, first of all, discount window lending, anybody who actually believes that's quantitative easing, you can just Google that. We don't even have to talk about that because you're getting a loan from the Fed 
at the market value of whatever it is that you're bringing to them that's not a treasury or mortgage-backed security, and you're getting a haircut on that. So if you actually think that that's quantitative easing, you need to act, you need to go back all the way back to school. Screw it. Investopedia cannot help you. Right. And quantity, um, most of the pickup uh, is the discount window, not BTFP. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We saw, we saw discount window lending pop up to $150 billion or so. And then it, now it's back in the 60s because we've seen three consecutive weeks of a shrinking Fed balance sheet. As far as the BTFP is concerned, we also have seen that come from 79 billion down to 71 billion. Well, guess what? You do get 100 cents on the dollar for your treasury or for your mortgage-backed security that you're sitting on a loss, uh, unrealized loss. That's great, but it's full recourse. And full recourse means strings attached. If you want the money, that's good. Why don't you consider raising some capital in exchange for taking the money? So these are only firms that are on their knees that are taking these loans. And again, it's a different kind of liability on the Fed's balance sheet. And you want to see these loans coming off. You'll see these loans pop right back up if we have another bank failure. Um, which everybody obviously hopes is not the case. And I will be, Jack, I'll be the first to say it right here. I will be extremely disappointed, dismayed. I'll be out there on Twitter screaming my head off if the Fed starts to take in First Republic's interest-only mortgages mm. that have yet to see the first principal payment demanded because that's a few years down the line. If they start compromising what they take at that window that would more closely resemble TARP or would mo more closely resemble when they opened the discount window to securities lenders on March the 18th of 2008, the day after Bear Stearns fail, failed on March the 17th, 2008, I'll, I'll be screaming. I will be. Um, and people are saying that the Fed's going to open a commercial real estate facility. They're going to open up as many facilities as need be. People have to remember that even in the heat of the, 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 the pandemic hitting the United States economy, Fed didn't touch CRE. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's more of an FDIC type of purview. Uh, and that would, yeah. that, that would be an even bigger departure from, from the Federal Reserve's Charter, Federal Reserve Act, than all the facilities in March 2020, because there's nothing more illiquid than a building. Like you're supposed to own, you know, I mean, people, people in the 1930s and 40s were mad when the Fed started owning treasuries, but you can't own a building. Yeah. And, and, and I think I think that Fed officials know that. And I think that that is why uh, when, when Janet Yellen was able to go back and and once again testify in front of Congress after she had taken her foot out of her mouth for saying, let all the small banks die and let them eat cake. The day after when she testified again, she said, you know what? This is an act of Congress. This doesn't have anything to do with me. Something this big needs to be congressionally um, it, it, we, we need to bring bring that into law. And I really do think that that's the case. If you're going to get anything that's quote unquote blanket. Mm, right. Well, uh, Danielle, it's been a pleasure uh, having you here. People can find you on Twitter at Demartino Booth. And so a lot of the charts that we put on screen today, in fact, all of them were from Quill Intelligence and actually uh, the Quill, which is your, your institutional product. You also have the Feather, which in our, our previous you know, um, interview we, we talked about. So uh, what, what's the website, Danielle, where people can find out more about that? So, you know, come to demartinoboost.substack.com. And if you're interested in our wider uh, array offering of, that we have for our institutional clients, private Twitter feed, um, the, the weekly, we, we send out investable, actionable um, ideas every morning. There's a Saturday piece that I publish, my intelligence briefing. Um, so if you're interested in that broader offering, uh, then once you're at demartinoboothsubsite.com, you'll see a num you'll see a, a, a click. You can click over to the, the bigger website. Mm. Uh, th thanks, Danielle. People should check that out. Danielle, just if, if you could summarize um, your views, you know, I think your economic views on, let's say, March 9th, the, the day before the fall of Silicon Valley, it was uh, you know, economically things were not looking great. But it's my sense that you really think this will cause a change in bank behavior, bank lending, uh, mm -hmm. that there will be a credit crunch. And of course, credit is, is really the fuel for, for GDP, you know, growth, uh, the labor market and, and everything. So you just give us a, a, a sort of final, final word. I do think the word credit crunch is appropriate. Uh, you know, people are not feeling it overnight. You're not seeing um, 
What, what, what you're not seeing is junk bond issuance stop completely. You're seeing that when we do have rallies in the market, hell, we just had a target date rebalancing, right? End of the quarter, end of March. So money physically was forced into the stock market. So we're seeing a lot of flow action. But as long as you're seeing levity in the stock market, you're seeing this CLO price, that high yield bond sold. I get it. That does not mean that banks are like, okay, we're opening up the spigots. That's not happening. And they're seeing that we have 65 large bankruptcies under the belt as of this taping, the highest number since 2009. These are not environments in which with an unemployment rate that will rise, banks are going to go all out when they're setting aside billions of dollars for loan loss provisions in the future that they're going to go out and loosen lending. It's just not happening. So I realize we're instant gratification generation. Let me just say, trust me. Uh, there we go. Um, Danielle, pleasure having you here. Uh, thank you everyone for watching. I'll say we're recording on uh, the afternoon of Tuesday, April 18th. We'll try and air this episode as soon as possible. Uh, but we're recording you know, after a lot of the large banks, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs have reported. Uh, but again, it's, the, it's those smaller regional banks that have mm -hmm. the deposit issues as well as commercial real estate uh, exposure. So you know, we'll, we'll see. Uh, Danielle, thank you. And uh, thank you everyone for watching. Thank you. Forward Guidance, the program you just enjoyed, hopefully, can be viewed on YouTube at BlockWorks Macro or heard as a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined. Check out today's sponsor, public.com at public.com slash forward guidance. That's public.com slash forward guidance. Also, you can get 10% off to Permissionless 2023 and BlockWorks Research using code GUIDANCE10. Thanks again and be well.